Christmas. It means something to everyone. What does Christmas mean to you? Does it mean decorations and gifts? Family and friends. Good memories. Or not so good memories. Wouldn't it make sense if there was actually something more to Christmas? What does Christmas mean? Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Do you see? Last week we started our uh, series called Do You See? And uh, you got to hear from, uh, from Pastor John. And this week will be my week. And next week uh, we'll have... Uh, Roy, I believe, is going to be it's going to be taken next week, and then uh, Mitch uh, will take the the final week. So we're kind of all just uh, tag team in this series and uh, seeing what the Christmas story is all about, and kind of focusing our hearts and our minds on what uh, Christmas is and the true miracle that is Christmas. But before we get started, I just kind of want to give give you guys a second. So what I want you to do, we've been doing this in our, in our student ministry for the past couple weeks. It's just kind of an, uh, a way to get things rolling as we talk about Christmas. So what I need you to do is just turn to the people next to you, and I want you to, like maybe one or two people, and tell them the best Christmas present that you've ever received. Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. So the best Christmas present you've ever received, go. For the kids, this is one of the few times you get to talk in church and nobody tells you to shush yet. All right. <laughs> no, don't do the worst. <laughs> that might be the person you're sitting next to that gave it to you. <laughs> well, for for me, probably if if I had to if I had to choose the best Christmas present that I ever received. For me, it would be, and I still uh, still have it to this day. But uh, it was my first my first acoustic guitar. Um, I asked my parents for it when I was like maybe fourteen or something like that, and uh, and I I begged them and begged them, and of course uh, my parent the first. Their first reaction to me wanting a guitar was, you don't know how to play the guitar <laughs> at all. Like, I'd never touched, I don't even know if I had ever touched a real guitar at that point. Uh, but I was 14 years old, and I was determined I was going to be the next uh, country music superstar. And so I was like, if I'm going to do that, i got to learn how to play guitar. And so... Uh, Somehow, some way, they uh, they convinced I convinced them to get me a guitar. Uh, I got it Christmas morning. Uh, it was a, a used like hand me down. It's big. It's it's loud. Uh, I could not play a single note on that thing <laughs> at all the first uh, the Christmas morning, and it was very very discouraging and very depressing. Fortunately, I had a friend of mine who also got a guitar, and uh, his parents could actually afford to give him a guitar and send him to guitar lessons. Uh, and so he would, I would go home with him after school, and he would show me what he learned in his guitar lesson uh, that day. And so I would try to learn secondhand from him. And so he got really, really good, and he's a professional musician now, and I can barely get by after like 15, 16 years of playing. Uh, so, but it was a, a great Christmas present because I look back on that now, and that really like changed the course of my life. And so as we look at the story of Christmas and what, the, and what Jesus is all about, and uh, today we're going to be looking specifically at the incarnation of God coming in the flesh and what that, what that actually means uh, for us to see that God has come to earth. And so what we need to realize is before we even dive into this too, too much, is that God coming in human form was purely out of his desire to have a relationship with us, his desire to have a relationship with us, not his need to have a relationship with us. And so often we, we are so self-centered and so self-focused that we think that Jesus Christ came for us. And that's true, but it wasn't because he needed a relationship with us. It was because God desired it so much that he was willing to move heaven and earth and change the course of human history in order to restore the relationship that we had broken originally. And so it's very important for us to realize that this was God's desire, not his need. He, ha he is self-sufficient in and of himself. And so the first thing we see that's miraculous about this idea of the incarnation is that Jesus was born of a virgin. 
He was born of a virgin, and we, we are familiar with the story, but I want to go back to, in the book of Isaiah, actually tells us exact that this was going to happen. It was prophesied hundreds of years before the Christmas event happened. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. And so this is, this is the verse where we know that Jesus had to be, had to be born this way. And so there was actually two, there's actually two prophecies in this, in this one verse. First is that Isaiah said that he will be born of a virgin. And then the second, it gives this title. It says that he gives this, uh, this word, Emmanuel. And it has an important meaning for us and for the miracle itself. Because Emmanuel, that title that was given to Jesus hundreds of years before he actually was born means something significant for us. Because up, up into the incarnation, the presence of God was either temporary, like we see in the garden. It says that, that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and talked with them, just as, you and I, just as you and I would walk and talk. And so, but when sin entered in the world, that relationship was forever broken. And so the rest, of the, the rest of the Old Testament, what we see is the presence of God or the Spirit of the Lord, as it's often called. The Spirit of the Lord would impress upon someone or the Spirit of the Lord would empower someone temporarily to accomplish a specific, a specific task. But the, the idea of God being able to rest and God being able to, to be present with us as humans in a, in a long-term relationship, that was, there was no way for, for God to be able to do that because sin, uh, sin had to be atoned for. And so what we see here is this is something altogether different because this was God clothed in humanity, coming as a baby to live among us and to show us the way that life was intended to be. So this was completely different from the way God empowered David or completely different from the way that God empowered Samson to defeat the Philistines and completely different from even the way that God's presence was, was represented by the Ark of the Covenant. All of those things were just kind of glimpses and snapshots and foreshadowings of, the way, of what God had in mind from the very beginning to send his son to come himself in order to restore a broken relationship. And so we saw that prophecy in Isaiah. I want to read the fulfillment of this prophecy that we find in Matthew chapter 1. So in Matthew chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 18, it says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a, ju being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And so not only does this prophecy of the virgin birth get fulfilled through Mary, but the fact that Joseph stayed with Mary when he had, the, when he had every legal right and justification to divorce her, that's a miracle in itself. And thankfully, Joseph was a godly man. And I'm sure if, you were, if we were uh, encountering an angel that was telling us exactly what was going on, it might be a little bit uh, intimidating. But so the angel explains how it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that this baby has been conceived in Mary. Because I'm sure to Joseph that must have been just an absolute terrifying circumstance to be engaged to be married and then your fiancé becomes pregnant. And this is a problem today. It's a big, big problem back then. And so Joseph didn't know what to do until the angel of the Lord came to him. And in Luke chapter 1, the angel comes and talks to Mary. And in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33, he says, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, he will reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. So an angel appears to Mary and comforts her. 
And it's assuring her that God is going to be with her through this pregnancy and through this, child, uh, through this birth. And that, will, that all of this will take place very soon. A virgin will give birth to a baby that she is not personally responsible for creating. And an angel appears to this young lady and her fiancé. And all of these things, say, God said, this is all stuff that has to happen. And so Joseph and Mary find themselves in these circumstances. And these are, are miraculous events. And we had these two, these two uh, people, both from the line of David, which was very important, as we saw in the prophecy, that this had to, become, had to come from the line of David. And so this idea of the incarnation had to come through this virgin birth. But also, it has the huge significance of what it means to have God with us. So God with us. So incarnation literally means in the flesh. For example, I am Jeremy Loki incarnate. I am in the flesh. I am not a hologram. I am not a robot. For better or for worse, this is me, right? <laughs> and that's you. And we're all, just, we're all in the flesh and we're all here physically. And so God, God does not exist that way up until, up until this point in, in human history. And it says that Jesus actually came in, in the flesh. John puts it this way as he starts uh, his gospel. He says, and the word, which is Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So the word actually became flesh. This idea that, that God had been separated from his creation for thousands of years and is now coming to us and walking among us once again through the person of Jesus Something that he was unable to do since the fall, which was, of course, our fault. So, as we, look at, as we look at this, I want us to see the miracle of the incarnation. Because because of this, God is now approachable to us. Because of this, like we can now have a relationship with him that was absolutely impossible before. He's approachable and available. And... Of course we know, and we've been going through this in our, uh, with our students over the last couple weeks. Uh, one week we looked at how Jesus was completely 100% human, and how he was, he was actually just, just like us physically in every way. But at the same time, he was also 100% divine, which means he was 100% God. And how those two things come together is still a mystery to this day that no one can really wrap their head around and understand. But it's so, so important that we realize that God, that Jesus had to be both fully divine and fully human. Because without the full divinity of Jesus, his death would not have paid the price for our sins. As we see in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So Jesus had to be fully, fully divine in order to satisfy the requirements of that sacrifice. Without the full humanity of Jesus, his death would not have extended his love to us. So we have both God demonstrating his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and paying the price that we could not pay. So God had to be fully present in Jesus so that he could be among those whom he created. God with us. Emmanuel. And I just want to take a minute to just kind of ponder that and meditate on that because it's something that I've been doing over the course of the few weeks, even before I even knew that we were going to be talking about this this morning is just trying to wrap my head around the idea of Jesus Christ being coming as this helpless child, of Jesus Christ coming into this dirty, messed up brokenness of our world, and him being able to show us the way that life was truly supposed to be lived. For him to be able to show us what it means to actually walk in the Holy Spirit every single day of our life. And him turning to his disciples and saying, guys, you can do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can do exactly what I'm doing. You will do greater things than what you've seen me do. And so Jesus showed us by, by his example. And there's a few things that I, I really think marked Jesus' ministry. And he, he welcomed the unloved. He valued the outcasts. He spoke to those and met the needs of those around him. And so for me, like, this is a, a really simple kind of, kind of application. But for me, the idea here is for us to be Jesus to other people, for us to show people Emmanuel, 
for us to be able to say, like, God is holy and God is separate and God is, is, is completely and 100% uh, to be glorified. But at the same time, God is still with us. Because those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have that same Holy Spirit living and breathing inside of us and empowering us to do the things that Jesus did and to love the people that Jesus loved. And so there's really not, uh, there's really not a big theological debate to get into, really. It's really more about just the practicalness of can we be Jesus to the people around us? And since Christmas is all about Jesus, it makes sense to just take some ideas from him and say, well, if, if, Jesus, if Christmas is just about Jesus, and Jesus was about welcoming the unloved, and about meeting the needs of the people around him, and about reaching out to, the, to those that nobody else wanted to touch, I mean, he, he went to some of, the, some of the most dirtiest, rottenest people that society had to offer, and he welcomed them, and he loved them, and he touched them, the people who were unclean. And I'm so thankful that Jesus wasn't afraid of getting his hands a little dirty and touching the things that were unclean, even though it got him in trouble with the religious people. Because I was one of those people. I was one of the unclean. You were one of the unclean. We were the broken. We were the outcast. We were all of the things that Jesus came in order to fix. And so, real simple, (laughs) What are some ways that you, can, uh, that you can do what Jesus did? Find a family in need. Provide some Christmas gifts for them at this time of year. Send cards of encouragement to those who are in prison. Serve others at a soup kitchen, homeless shelter. And as you heard uh, earlier that was mentioned, uh, go, go to Willow, Willow Ridge tonight at 6 p.m. And we're going to uh, sing some Christmas carols and remind, people, uh, remind the people there what the true meaning of Christmas is really about, which is Jesus Christ coming, Emmanuel, God with us. So I don't know about you, but that's really all that I want to be able to do is to show people what Jesus looked like. That's the command that he gave his disciples. Go and make disciples. I've made you disciples. Now go and do the same. Whenever he talked to people, whenever he encountered anyone, it was go and sin no more. It was go and do, do the things that I've, that I've instructed you to do. Go and reach the people and touch the lost and fix the brokenness that you see all around you. And that was a very simple message of Jesus. And there's so much depth and so much written, richness to that. But I really didn't want to overcomplicate things and, and, and get really high and lofty with it. Other than just saying, if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he is then that means that everything that he said was true. Which means that when, he's, when he tells us that the same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead lives inside of us, that changes a lot. That changes how I approach everything. That changes what, my, what I think about and what I talk about and the way I interact with people. It changes how I raise my kids and how I love my wife. And those things don't always happen 100% the right way. But that's the sanctification process. That's that process of becoming more and more like Jesus each and every day. That idea that you hear about a lot of long obedience in the same direction. And so that's what I'm calling us to. That's what I'm challenging myself with. Is to remind people around us that Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. God in the flesh. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you that your son came, and God, not to, not to just be a child, not to just live a good life, or not just to be a teacher, but Father, your son came to show us what life truly is about, to show us what life truly is, but God, he came so he could be the perfect sacrifice for us, and to do for us what we were absolutely unable to do for ourselves. God is through his death, through his resurrection, his defeat of sin and grave and death itself that we can live. So Father, I hope and I pray that as we anticipate the celebration of Christmas, that we would not lose track of the simple concept of Emmanuel, God in flesh, God being with us, God in you, 
empowering us to live lives that we could not live on our own. It's in Christ's name we pray.